Hi, how are you? It's great to have you. I wanted to thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. I, I know uh, how, how busy you are, and I, I wanted to say that uh, that you and, and Director Burns have done such an amazing job of uh, keeping us uh, safe and abreast of the issues uh, as they're unfolding uh, around the world. And um, uh, again, thank you for your service and, and for joining us today. So um, maybe I could kick it off with uh, you know, a question about uh, the uh, what we're seeing currently in, in Ukraine in terms of the you know massing of uh, large amounts of uh, what looks to be a, a major offensive in the east, and uh, and maybe a, a little bit of a change in uh, strategy uh, by uh, by President Putin. And I was wondering if you could kind of tell us what you're seeing right now, what you might anticipate, and what our audience, by the way, we do have a former DNI in the audience today, uh, John Negroponic. Oh. So uh, we've got uh, many uh, diplomats and, and, and leaders here. So thank you for your time. But I'll start with that, that, that question of what you're seeing currently. That's great. Well, we should get Director Negroponte up here as well, <laughs> I think, to add to this. He's wonderful, as is Bill Burns. I, I'm very lucky with the colleagues and the predecessors I've had who all are incredibly generous. But thank you so much, Ambassador Halliday. I, I think it's, um, it's actually lovely to be included as part of the intelligence community in a forum like this, because I, I really believe that part of what we can do in the intelligence community is to support diplomacy. And I can't think of anything that's more important in crises, for example, like the Russia-Ukraine one that we're experiencing. And the more we can help leaders think about how you actually deploy the intelligence community in ways that is supportive of policy decision making that's better i think the better for all of us in many respects and i i also learn so much from having an opportunity to engage with folks like yourself and others who have had the opportunity to use the intelligence community in ways so really appreciate it and i think um you know i i know we don't have that much time and we're hoping to get to questions so uh, I'll sort of do a very short piece on Russia, Ukraine, but if it's all right with you, I'd love to be able to highlight, frankly, how I think intelligence diplomacy that both Bill and I have engaged in and, and others throughout the intelligence community uh, to sort of support what's being done in the process. Absolutely, process. yes. Okay, so I, I mean, I think you're right, first of all, that there is a shift, although it's kind of interesting to watch in the sense that um, what we see is a shift in military objectives. It's not clear that Putin has really shifted on his political objectives in many respects. And um, and that's a, you know, that will be something that I think will play out over time as we see what happens and how he effectively engages or doesn't in these talks and comes to, you know, sort of outcomes and whether those outcomes are real outcomes or whether there are pauses in a broader effort that he's engaged in as we've seen over the years uh you know in terms of his own ambitions in relation to the region and we can obviously go into that further but one of the things that i found really interesting about this crisis frankly is the fact that you know as we began to see plans of uh essentially the russians preparing options for invading ukraine what we did was we, you know, in sort of our typical manner, went to the policy community and laid out the intelligence and provided our own assessments of what it is that we were seeing. And, you know, the policy community quite naturally turned to the question of, okay, we need to talk to our partners and our allies on what's happening, both to prepare responses to what might be, you know, occurring over the coming months, but also to see whether or not it would be possible in the preparation of those responses to really effectively deter Putin from taking the kind of action that uh, he was contemplating clearly during this period. And I think, you know, that sort of led to a discussion of, okay, well, what do our allies and our partners think about this? And there was a fair amount of skepticism among many, and even within our own policy community, I think it's fair to say, you know, concern that we were reading this correctly and that we were seeing these uh, preparation of options as serious options as opposed to a sort of course of um, a show of force that might ultimately be deployed as such. And, uh, and so we, you know, I think really went out to our partners and allies and, you know, that's Bill and I and others. There's so many people within the intelligence community across the board that engage in those kinds of uh, discussions and um, things. And it is 
honestly a whole of intelligence community effort because you're using essentially every intelligence form that you have, whether it's human intelligence or imagery or, you know, measures or a variety of things that people think of, signals intelligence and so on. We bring the picture together and then we try to do our best to release as much of it as we can while protecting sources and methods. And uh, I was deployed to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to sort of give a brief of what we were seeing. We uh, also um, were deployed and I was particularly asked to, to talk to the EU and the in particular the folks that were looking at sanctions options, not surprisingly, and really to lay the groundwork in effect for our diplomats to then engage on what you know actions might in fact be contemplated, both in the context of force posture or sanctions or other actions that might be engaged in or thought about and what the impact of those options might be is another thing that the intelligence community gets asked you know so okay you're seeing this let's assume for the moment that this is going to happen how would you uh, look at these options that we're considering what do you think the impact would be on russia how do you think putin would respond to them would it be um escalatory would it deter you know that sort of thing um, would it exceed his expectations, meet his expectations in the context of those responses? And so really interesting conversations. And I'll tell you, we learned a lot from engaging with our allies and partners on these issues. Mm -hmm. They have very adept and expert uh, intelligence communities themselves and many experts on Russia and people who have seen essentially how things have developed over the years. And so they had a lot to add to that conversation. And as things developed, we obviously were also engaged by the policy community in essentially disclosing information where it was an opportunity for us to be pushing out information that the policy community could deploy in order to counter disinformation from the Russians or to make it more challenging for them to engage in establishing pretexts basically for taking action in Ukraine and, and spinning their own narrative in effect as a way of um, you know, uh, legitimizing some of the actions that they might take. And so I think we've learned a lot of lessons through the process, but it's also been, uh, I think, quite gratifying to see the degree to which we could be helpful in essentially setting that table in those conversations. And you also saw Bill, for example, engaging, you know, bringing his expertise and knowledge and network to bear in so many extraordinary ways. And, uh, you know, not just going to Moscow, but also to Kiev and to so many of our uh, allies and partners in this context as well. So I think yeah. it was a very interesting experience in many ways. Yes. I, I was just going to say to your point, um, it seems that in this case, in this conflict, in the run up to it, that the intelligence was used uh, you know, by the diplomats and by heads of state um, in real time. And I just was curious as to, that kind of represents a, a shift. Uh, you know, sometimes the intelligence community is very guarded about what they will release, uh, obviously protecting sources and methods, but um, as you said, uh, to, to prevent a pretext or countering disinformation, it's, it's moving very quickly and has that been a challenge in the interagency and in the bureaucracy to kind of get those decisions that consensus uh made quickly yeah i think you know the answer to that question yeah. <laughs> but it's 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 yeah. happening so it is it's true i mean i think yeah absolutely there were a number of concerns i mean there's the sources and methods issue as you properly identify and and uh you know i think we are cautious but continue to look to see whether or not we made the right calculation in doing that, right? Because it's a long-term thing to see whether or not you actually um, burn your sources and methods through disclosures. And uh, and here we took a little bit of additional risk to think that we might otherwise uh, take, but we all agreed to it and achieved consensus, I'd say, at least within the intelligence community in our approach. And, um, and that really is, uh, I think, you know, just speaks to the leadership that exists throughout the community. I am one piece of, and, you know, sort of a facilitator and coordinator and 
help to lead, but it is, um, it's really a robust community and, uh, and have some just extraordinary leaders across the community that participate in that conversation. I'd say another thing too, though, is that you also as an intelligence community want to maintain your distance from policy to some extent. And one of the concerns that was raised is, uh, you know, that's a reasonable one that I had myself was just that we not be perceived as a tool of policy and, um, and that our, our credibility uh, would stand on its own. And we tried to be careful about that too. And I, you know, in um, presentations and briefings with NATO or others, we did our best to answer the questions in, you know, as thorough and as um, sort of on the level uh, approach as we could in saying, here's sort of one perspective, here's another perspective, here's sort of the different views that are being expressed within the intelligence community. It's, it's an interesting case because, you know, on the one hand, you had very real physical evidence of, you know, imagery and other things that, you know, you can't move that number of military units without it being noticed. But then the question is, what's the intent? What's the, what, what is the intent behind that? And, and, and I, I would think that the challenge with such a, a very narrow leadership structure in Russia is there's really only maybe one or two uh, people who uh, guard that intent. So you, you really have to study, I'm sure, the decision-making habits and the, uh, you know, sort of the motivations of, of the man. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. And, um, and intent is, you know, one of those things that's extremely challenging <laughs> to really, right, you can have sort of the best sources in the world. And the question is, is he lying to them? Is it you know real or not? What's the, so it is um, it, it, not without its challenges. I think it is also part of the humility of what we do, which is to say that um, look, you have obviously yourself, but I think Meridian and, and the Diplomacy Forum is focusing, among other things, on science and the way in which we bring that into a variety of different types of decision making. And in many ways, this is a place where I think it's quite similar um, in the intelligence community, which is to say that uh, we have expertise that is extraordinary. We have a tradecraft and a methodology through which we take you know, exquisite intelligence, we combine it with open source information, we analyze it, and we try our very best to provide our observations and our assessments um, in a way that allows policymakers to understand the thinking that went into essentially how we reached our conclusions, but also with the sort of understanding that, that our expertise is a piece of what we're bringing to the table and our trade craft is mm -hmm. critical to that. We don't have a dog in the fight. We're not looking to convince you of a particular outcome and we can be wrong and that can happen all the time, but we actually try to put on the table what it is that we assess at the time. And so I think, you know, we have a certain, like we have ways of doing this such as levels of confidence that I know you're familiar with, but. Um, but others may not be. And it helps people to understand we have this level of confidence when we're making this assessment. You know, it gives you a sense that we're not so sure or we are pretty sure. And, yeah. you know, that it, it, must be, uh, it must be also, um, you know, given the community's, uh, you know, sort of recent experience, the idea of, of being able to call balls and strikes and not have, you know, the news or the messaging be viewed as, you know, uh, pushing one way or the other, but giving it to the policymakers, that really comes from the top, I would think, and the culture that you all have uh, established with uh, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin, you know, uh, Director Burns, and, uh, and that, that's, that's how it's supposed to, supposed to work. I wanted to, I know we don't have much time, I wanted to just shift, before uh, Ukraine, um, we were, you know, uh, really focused uh, collectively on this question of space. And I know that you all uh, issued your 2022 threat assessment looking at sort of the, the risk of militarization of space. It's obviously something where there's, there's still, you know, emerging definitions, ideas, norms, uh, but it's, it's apparent that space is, you know, whether it's the creation of the Space Force or some of the new treaties we've established with, uh, with Australia and others, uh, what Singapore is doing. What can you tell us about your thinking about space and how uh, the United States needs to view it? Is it a battle domain? Is it a commercial domain? Is it all the above? Um, 
and, and how critical was it to the thinking of our uh, security uh, leaders? Yeah, it's so important. I mean, I think space is just, it's critical to our prosperity, right? And we increasingly see that, I think. It's um, our capacity to pursue scientific research and really our national security. And, and it's changing quite a lot. I mean, I think that's something that in the last, you know, 10, 20 years, what we've seen is an extraordinary increasing reliance on space, both from, you know, as I mentioned, the sort of economic perspective, um, but for critical services, for critical infrastructure in so many states, and for our militaries, for our operations in a variety of ways. And the fact is that the number of commercial firms that are operating in space has just exploded for the most part. And the same time, we're seeing that that is creating a very crowded area, even though I mean, crowded in space is maybe you know, a different perspective, but certainly more than what we've seen in the past. And to your point, Russia and China in particular are increasingly seeing, as we indicate in the annual threat assessment, seeing space as a war fighting domain with both um, states really having developed counter space weapons, both from the ground and from space. And these are, are sort of the, the landscape setting points that, that we make in a lot of our work is we're trying to help the policy community think through, okay, how do you address this situation? And I think there's an increasing kind of recognition of the fact that frankly, norms and rules around space behavior are absolutely necessary and need to be further developed from where they are today. And, you know, one of the things that sort of intersects with the Ukraine-Russia crisis is that we saw last November, um, so not that many months ago, essentially uh, Russia test um, a missile, essentially a ground-based anti-satellite weapon and create an enormous amount of debris. And at the time, I think the Space Force, you know, basically said, look, what we're seeing is, uh, I think they had something like over 1500 uh, orbit debris material and that they would expect to see really hundreds and thousands, hundreds and th hundreds of thousands of fragments that would effectively be um, in the atmosphere or rather in space and in the orbit. And this creates all kinds of safety issues, including you know, the potential for collision and not just with objects, but also with objects with people on them, such as the International Space Station or the Chinese Space Station in this context. And so it's another example of an area where um, you know, we are sort of uh, trying to make sure that people understand in effect this domain and that they recognize both the value of it, but also the threats that are associated with it. And, recognize, therefore, the need to focus on how to manage it. So I wanted to ask you a, a last question. Uh, you talked a little bit about science. And one of the things that we announced earlier was a, a program that Meridian's doing uh, with some partners to sort of help young scientists gain more awareness of diplomacy and international affairs and the idea that these two worlds need to be more married up for the benefit of both. But you have a, you have a degree in, in physics, as I understand, undergrad, right? So you took a, a, a turn into law and policy, uh, but I, I was curious as to a how you might use your 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 physics or science background in your in your job in terms of critical thinking and analysis. But but also, how do you uh, how does the intelligence community use or depend or work with scientists? Yeah, it's a great. I mean, first of all, I should just tell you that. Um, I, I was always a kind of a math and science geek growing up, and uh, and I cannot tell you how disappointed my father was when I, when I left physics. It was really, you know, one of these moments, and it, it was not, I, I sort of ended up, I, I took a leave effectively from a graduate uh, piece, and I, I thought, okay, I'm going to do um, some business for a while, and I had sort of other interests and wanted to understand what it meant to be part of a community and open up a business and so on. And thought I would go back to it, and just never did. And I um, and I miss some aspects of it, but I do love the degree to which, frankly, science comes into play and uh, you know in the intelligence community. And and in many ways, the intelligence community is probably the most uh, similar to the academic environment that you find in government. That's kind of my own perspective on this, having worked in a lot of different parts of government. It is um, increasingly, as a consequence, I would say, in need of science 
to understand the world, right? I mean, if, if basically what we're trying to do is have a more uh, adept picture of the landscape that we're facing in the world today in the context of national security, we have to have science as part of it. And an area that sort of, you know, uh, comes to mind most obviously probably is climate, Arctic, things like that, right? And uh, and when you, you think about um, climate, for example, as a perfect thing, like we did a national intelligence estimate on climate. And in that context, we um, worked with a, a climate science advisory group that um, council that, that had been set up that allowed us to tap into essentially uh, scientists throughout the government. And we have adjoining it, a group that includes academic scientists and also folks from the private sector. And we bring them together to talk to the analysts for a variety of aspects of the challenge. But, but just to give you a sense of how I think where the real magic occurs, because it's sort of, I think a caricature of us sometimes, which is, you know, that we're looking at climate negotiations and, you know, and that's the main purpose of the intelligence community in the context of climate, right? Like, but really what we need to do is be able to understand the physical effects, for example, of climate change and how that is likely to exacerbate, again, geopolitical tensions in the world today, right? So if you look at the Arctic and you consider, okay, as the you know, ice melts and uh, and as we see some of the develops right in the Arctic, recognize that natural resources, commercial, you know, maritime lanes, other things are going to become more available. That is going to create more tension, right, in this region. And we see, you know, activities that Russia or China are engaged in, right. other to maneuver themselves. And I think part of the the, as I was sort of saying, the magic of it is to constantly be talking to the science to understand exactly how those physical effects are going to develop. And then it's really the analysts that have the background knowledge from the regional, the functional pieces, who can then start to say, ah, OK, this is how we think this state would likely react. This is how this is likely to develop. Here are the interests that we would need to then factor into our other work. And that's just one example, recognizing how little time well, we have. That's, a, that's a perfect segue into the discussion uh, on Arctic, uh, the oceans and space that will take place this afternoon. And uh, Director Haynes, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope to have you in person at some point in the future, but we really appreciate it. And uh, be well, be safe, and, and thanks for your service. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Really lovely uh, to see you. And I do look forward to being out of this COVID world. I